my parents end up getting into a legal battle. He was trying to communicate something to his barrister and the barrister never understood it. And I think at that point I um, realized, you know, that there is definitely a need like to have more people that are have got more language skills to go into the law so that they can actually correctly represent. So let me try and see as many languages that I can pick up so that I can then use them to help as many people as possible. There's an issue there. There's nobody doing anything about it. What can we do about it? Name is Professional Women of Faith. So that was the first organisation that I was involved in helping set up. It's really to empower women um, to use their faith as a strength and not see it as a weakness. In that, with Castle Fostering, we've had an opportunity to educate um, local authorities about the importance of trying to find children that have the right religious match as well and get people to actually work together, come together for the benefit of our next generations and future generations. Welcome back to the Culture Cast podcast. Today, my guest is a solicitor and entrepreneur from London. She is the chair of the Professional Women of Faith Network, the co-founder of Carlsa Fostering and the president of Seek Games. And she's also the cultural advisor to the Mayor of London. Welcome, Mandeep Moore. How are you doing? Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. No worries. Um, the way I like to start every podcast is basically taking a trip down memory lane uh, and just a bit of a cultural sort of background and your upbringing and a bit of context on um, how you were brought up. Yes, yeah, so um, I was born and raised in Southall, West London. And, um, you know, later on, we kind of moved uh, to um, Virginia Water in Surrey. So, yeah, that, it, was a, it was a good background. It was fun. Uh, my parents had businesses based in Southall. Um, my mum never used to drive, so they wanted to stay like close enough to all their shops and things. So it was a lot of fun. Never got bored. <laughs> yeah. So it was good. I can imagine. Um, Southall is like the, the hub for Punjabi people. So I imagine that yeah. you're surrounded by a lot of other other people who look <laughs> like yourself, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which actually, I guess, yeah, it, it was very much. Um, there was a, not just kind of uh, Punjabi. So there was a lot of Pakistanis there. They, there was a huge kind of variety. I would say a lot of South Asians were there. Yeah, that's probably a, a better um, term, South Asians, is a broader umbrella. I always say, like, uh, when I speak to people from down south, like, I'm from Newcastle, and there wasn't that variety up here uh, and diversity. Yeah. So it's it's um, it's a stark contrast when you when you go down south from up here and and see, like, more diverse, like, people and obviously the upbringing that is is tied to that. Do you think that um, has, has helped you in, in what, all the things that we're going to come on to later on? Yeah, I think it definitely has. I think, um, like, I kind of grew up, like, with my parents, kind of, we had, we have one of our shops where for 21 years, we were right next to a Gurdwara. Um, we were diagonally opposite to a Mandar, you know, we were like a couple of minute walk away from, and, and there was a church as well, op diagonally opposite us, and there was like a couple of minute walk away from uh, the masjid. So it was quite nice, because we kind of, I felt like, you know, my whole kind of, um, upbringing I got a lot of understanding as to different cultures different religions and obviously when you're in business a lot of people actually come and talk to you mm -hmm. um so you know with my parents like they would support even like if there was like uh, obviously if there was a Sikh event happening they would be supporting but if the mandir ever needed help or support or the church ever needed help or support the masjid you know they would always come to us <clears throat> so I think it's safe to say we were like very kind of well connected and well versed and and actually managed to learn quite a few different languages as well, <laughs> being in South or which is good. I feel like, especially at a young age, when you're having all these interactions with a diverse amount of people, it ends up like you end up breaking down barriers that might might be there if you don't have them interactions, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, definitely. I think, um, it, I think it really helps because it really kind of gives us the confidence when we go into like any kind of setting, you can literally carry a conversation with anyone. Mm -hmm. um, how I had it was I was two years old uh, when my parents went into business. So they would kind of be at the counter. And obviously we never had any of my grandparents which lived in the UK. Um, you know, they lived in India. Um, and uh, well, my granddad, he used to go between India, UK and America. Um, so he was kind of like in and out of the UK. Um, but but it was very much like my parents, you know, they kind of had to bring us up and it meant that, you know, we were at the back when they were like serving customers. In fact, I, 
I think I was 12 years old when I um, used to deal with our textiles business and I was literally talking about import and export of textiles like quite regularly. <laughs> so it was quite, it was really good. I think it was a really good experience to kind of be able to do that. But yes, definitely got a lot of um, a head start with a lot of things. Yeah, hundred percent. You learn them um, communication skills, which are really vital and you get like a sort of adaptability and entrepreneurship, which, which is one of the things that we're going to come on to talk about. But um, the first topic is, is your background as solicitor. So um, tell us a bit of your, how you got into that, what was the process and obviously like uh, your education and leading up to it and how that's sort of going. So for me, it was, I think um, the journey of actually going into um, you know, the law wasn't one where I kind of just fell into law. It was very, um, like I knew I was going to go into law. Um, I think I was uh, just finishing up primary school, going into high school, and uh, my parents ended up getting into a legal battle um, with somebody. And it was a very, like a very straightforward breach of contract. And, um, you know, my parents took him to court. But the kind of issue that kind of occurred was, um, my parents, obviously my dad, um, English uh, wasn't his first language. He was trying to communicate with um, his barrister um, because he happened to be up against four lawyers. So the people the, the people he was up against, there were four lawyers. So he really had to try and get like the best barrister. So he would go into the city um, and, and, and go to these chambers that have meetings there. What actually happened, um, he was trying to communicate something to his barrister and the barrister never understood it and took, uh, basically communicated the wrong thing. Um, but it was, it was a language kind of, um, it, was, it, was, it was a language barrier, right? That you can't, even though you've got enough English language to kind of look after your business and, and do what you need to do, but then, um, and, and to get by, but it wasn't to the level where you can explain uh, to a lawyer who speaks a completely different language, what it is you're trying to communicate. And these things, they have so many um, intricacies, you know, so you've got to be really, really careful. And I think at that point, I um, realized, you know, that there is definitely a need, like, to have more people that are, have got more language skills to go into the law so that they can actually correctly represent uh, people. So uh, from that point, I started um, learning, um, well, I was already learning Punjabi, um, but I started learning Hindi, I started learning Urdu, and uh, I thought, let me try and see as many languages that I can pick up so that I can then use them to help as many people as possible um, and to help the community as much as possible. But I used to be part of like the law clinics, I used to be part of mooting clubs, I used to like literally um, grab every single opportunity because throughout my very early, like my, my, my teenage years even, I would talk to lawyers, I would talk to barristers and I would say, what does it take? You know, and if it was mock trials, I would be at the mock trials. Like, you know, if it was one of my lecturers said, you know, we need somebody to host this. I would literally be the first person to raise my hand because I knew that is something that I wanted to do. And I was very lucky in that once I finished university, I, I kind of, um, I got like a work experience kind of a paralegal position and, um, literally within about 10 months you know I was going on to a new firm to start my training contract and and while I was having my exit interview with the person I was doing my paralegal um, position with um, he was literally on his computer on the SRA website printing a form and he said look I'm going to get you to sign your training contract just stay um, so it was a really really um, um, I was blessed in that I um, knew what I wanted to go what I wanted to do and where I wanted to go um, and really just work towards that journey. It, do, it doesn't sound there's any luck involved, to be fair. It sounds like you, you've, you've worked very hard to get to the point, yeah. to that point. You know what I mean, <laughs> I mean uh, we could call it luck, but I think it's a lot of hard work that goes into it. And uh, as, as was said before, I think like obviously that, um, that background that we, we come from does obviously inspire you to do certain things like in a similar position for myself was uh, we have businesses up here and it was a it was a similar uh, issue um, where you, you're surrounded by all this legal jargon all the time and you want to understand it yeah so you dive into it a bit more and then you, you sort of just follow that passion I guess and and, yeah. and sort of just continue into it Um, I didn't know that you spoke so many different languages like I imagine that's quite hard to pick up did you find any difficulties in learning all of them 
you know what? it was easy i just practiced with the customers that came into the shop oh, <laughs> it was really easy uh, but the other thing we would do is we would um because we had so many different suppliers so there was a couple of other languages i was always trying to pick up on like gujarati i would always try and pick up on that um but never quite got there <laughs> Uh, the the bit I know is Maro Gujarati fine chair, which means my Gujarati is good, but actually is not. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, I think um, like because I was quite keen on learning languages, and you know, it's obviously like it's beneficial. Like my parents knew loads of languages, you know, because they kind of came here quite young um, when they started their businesses, and they kind of they they you know they've got like so many different types of suppliers, so many different types of customers. You they learned so much. So even at home. Um, we have like with my nephew and niece now um, over there <laughs> um, with them we kind of have like um, like an hour where we'll just speak um, uh, like literally we'll just speak Punjabi or we'll just speak Hindi or we'll just speak um, try and speak Urdu uh, my brother even tries to teach him like Chinese and and like um, I'm trying to teach her like a little bit of French because that's something that I knew because it's like children are like sponges right but it's, yeah. it's so beneficial learning languages it's it's actually a lot of fun as well, I guess. Yeah, I think it's like it's a blessing and a curse, like living in England, because English is so widely spoken that you don't really need to learn another language. But that's like the yeah. curse side of it. But the blessing is, is obviously it's so widely spoken. Um, it, it is very interesting. Like when you when you were learning, I think in kids, I had um, Rabina Korwan and she, she does the children's book, Happy the Hafti. Ah, oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and she was speaking about like... Uh, like uh, the kids brains and all that as you said like sponges but when you learn more and more languages as a child it literally like um it increases their cognitive uh function and, and so it's 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 really interesting when you get into like the nuts and crannies yeah. i'm not smart enough to talk about that side of things but uh, it is very interesting yeah but it actually also gives you a lot of um confidence as well so um we went on holiday and um my niece she literally went over um, on a, on a, on, on, at the train station at the platform, she literally went over to a Chinese family and she went, Ni hao. And yeah. they were so happy. And that was like almost like us going to a holiday, like to Italy or somewhere like that. And then someone coming up to us and saying Sasri girl to us. And they're not even Punjabi. We'd be like, that is so cool. But you know, it's so nice because she knows, like, even at that young age, she was, I think she was about three then, but she's got the confidence to go up to people and strike a conversation because she has, she's already got the first kind of step yeah. you know, of how to approach people. But yeah. I think as well, like, as we were saying before, is that with, with when you're children and your kids, you don't really have these sort of um, barriers. Do you know what I mean? You just, you're a lot more open to, to go and talk to a variety of people because you don't have these like preconceptions in your mind. So it's very easy to yeah. break these barriers down. And um, also, um, also like understanding as well, because you understand a lot of their kind of culture mm -hmm. as well. Um, you understand like when um, they have religious festivals, you understand a lot of stuff when you kind of live close to people. So it's like on our road where you would have like when it was Basaki and when it was Diwali and or Baddi and um, like how people celebrate when it was Eid. Um, you know, there are like um, a Ramzani auntie down the road. She would like bring us sweets when it was Diwali. We would take us sweets. So it's like you understand a lot about one another as well. I think that's that's like massively underrated as well because when you do that understanding as as them people who uh, got spoken to Chinese uh, were so happy that happens with everybody like when you yeah. when you show like an ounce of uh, interest in somebody else that uh, the amount of like happiness that brings like as yeah. a kid I was always interested in religions like Ari was my favorite lesson at school oh. I would always be like in uh, finding out as much as I could about different religions and then when you do talk to people of that religion and you show that like you, you have a bit of knowledge they they appreciate that so much and as yeah. we do as well as Sikhs if somebody came up to me and asked me about Makara uh, which people do and uh, I find it so like I just get that sense of happiness do you know like, I, I really entertain them it. After. yeah exactly yeah um as well as uh, as well as a solicitor uh, job you also are an entrepreneur as we already mentioned probably coming from your background with your parents having businesses absolutely and so, <laughs> surround, yeah surrounded by business so you, you get yeah. into that so uh, what made you sort of uh, jump into that side of things um to be honest I think it's always this kind of um I, I completely blame my parents for this <laughs> um 
I, you know, I should thank them for it, really. Um, so, yeah, like I said, I was really young. Um, you know, when I was 12, I used to uh, manage the whole of, like, the import and export of textiles, which was, like, um, for me, it was just fun because yeah. I felt like it was, like, um, you know, organising things and doing things. And, and I didn't know what it was going to lead up to. Um, but obviously now we've, um, when, when I was about, um, it's about 25, I think, and uh, me and my best friend, you know, we were just talking, we went to university together and um, we were just saying, we'd always thought we were going to go into the events industry. I don't know. It's this excitement <laughs> about being yeah. involved in events. And um, so, yeah, we kind of started up, um, it started off as an event design and decor company. It was really to just get the creativity out there and to just kind of have some fun on the weekends. Uh, but now actually we've, uh, we do like large productions and event planning. Um, so we do like events um, from like, I was going to say 100, but now it's 15, 15 up to like 25,000 people. So like oh. events on Trafalgar Square, those are the kind of events that we'd organize at large productions, um, you know, sporting events, loads of different things that we, we, we've got our kind of, uh, we've got involved in now. How, how do you go from being a, a solicitor to a events company? <laughs> like so, what what was the what? what was the obviously you said you had that conversation but what actually like is the the steps that you've got to take um so actually the solicitor job happens during the week um yeah. and then the events are meant to happen on the weekend um but they kind of go into your evenings and things like that so i think if you see it as it's if you say that it's stressful it's going to be stressful mm -hmm. but if you say that you enjoy it you'll most likely enjoy it but actually i do enjoy it yeah. Because it's like, um, like one thing that I, I think we did kind of struggle with was um, kind of finishing work at eight, nine o'clock um, in the evening, you know, when you've got like a trial or something coming up and then waking up on Saturday morning at 4 a.m. to go and get flowers like that life was hard. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of cool that we we're not so much into the decor side as much as we used to be uh, when we started off. Um, but there are certain things like, for example, like. Um, I'm quite closely linked to Shepherd's Bush Gurdwara and whenever they need flowers because it's for the Guru Gar, that was some, that's something we'll always always do um, but that's kind of I guess that that, that is a little bit different um, but then generally speaking um, it's um, it, I feel like often one offsets the other and interestingly enough when you tap into your creative mind you will always find solutions for things other things as well so like when I'm doing flowers I'll just be there and I'm like kind of just got my music on or like my shabad on or you know I'm just doing my thing and I'll, I'll like automatically think oh my god you know something's just come to my mind you know we were looking at this this way we were looking at this litigation this way or perhaps if we put this spin on it but this is the thing it's you tap into your mind's full potential when you go in when you're doing more than just one thing I find I was going to say, do you think that the, the two help each other? And well, obviously you just mentioned it there that it, it does. Um, the other thing I was going to say that you, you already mentioned that the discipline and organization that it must take. I mean, you, you must be like one of the most busy, busy scheduled person with obviously the, the full-time job as solicitor. You've got the uh, decorations company going on and then you, the board of these charities as well. Like your schedule must be jam-packed 24-7 um yes it is uh, but you know what? I enjoy it I enjoy it I'm not gonna lie I do enjoy it and I um I it, it's just one of those you know you've just got to be like creative with how you actually organize your diary and how you organize yourself so I'm very much um you know about this kind of method where you dedicate a certain percentage of your time to your actual income a certain percentage of time to your fitness and and yourself Mm -hmm. um, and a certain percentage of time to your charities and organizations and a certain percentage of your time for your future self like so for example like now this year we started going into properties um, so that is I would deem that as my future self um, and um, my kind of um, my uh, main income streams are obviously being a lawyer so I'll do that on the weekends I split it differently so on the weekends we take that time and um, we we use that time for obviously the kind of events um, that being the kind of the main income um, and then still making sure that you focus on the other things as well because I think I, I think it's just a perception I personally don't feel like I came into this world to have a nine to five 
and to come back and you know have children and you know one day just not waking up kind of thing I feel like every single person has a skill set every single person comes across issues which they have almost a duty to get involved in and to rectify and um, so for me I feel like I if something comes in front of me or an issue comes in front of me I need to either fix it myself or get someone else to fix it but I can't just kind of like let it go I just feel like there are those things also if you've got um, the mindset to solve problems and you've got the mindset to grow movements like for example like the seat games and, and castle fostering even you've got the mindset to try and push these kind of initiatives you should do that um and you just and if you once you take on that responsibility to yourself that you know you've also got a duty to and and for what i say is i have a duty to a galbar to do other things right um then um that's lord lord almighty um to like do these things and and, and to help um other people in ways that i can um i will make sure i do that that's a the percentages of time i've never heard of that before i, I do like reading a lot of like self help books and business oriented books is that something that you came up with yourself or is that for for me so i used to do it myself anyway so what i used to do is i used to have like what you'll see is like my kind of calendar and actually during lockdown for some reason for first it was always a spreadsheet now i've gone into like a physical calendar because obviously you can't have physical movement so i'll, I'll just move my hand a little bit more and i use like kind of highlighters but i allocate different colors to different tasks right but if it's something for myself or for my fitness it'll always be yellow if it's something for like my work it'll be green if it's something for charities it'll be orange so those are kind of things that I've kind of always been doing but I've been having them on my spreadsheet for literally years just because it gives me clarity um to make sure I'm spending enough time so it's like I like to live in the moment I don't like to the one thing I can't deal with is guilt like it's like a lot of people feel this overwhelm and and a lot of people talk to me about it and you're wasting time even thinking about it so whereas the way I I find that it works well for me is um when I kind of break it down this way I know there is a day for it and there's a time for it and I'm going to get to it and I can visually see my whole kind of month to see what day what thing happens you know and I try and do it on a day and you also realize what days you know you're more productive like on um like mondays i know the kind of tasks i'm going to do on a monday i know what kind of my days look like on a tuesday but i think what what you allow yourself to do is um to not be distracted and to take that guilt element out of the out of the equation and you're just focusing on the task at hand so when you're with your clients or when you've picked up a file for your client you should not have ever be thinking about other things like you should actually only have your focus on that um you know and the same applies for the charities if you're going to be a part of it and you're going to put yourself up to doing the seva you need to do the best work of your life when you're doing it you know yeah it's that, it's the discipline isn't it it's it's just knowing what you're going to do and when and it sounds it, it sounds so simple when you put it like that but obviously a lot of people i don't think would implement it did we a lot of people don't think like that and it is a it's interesting because I, i like talking to all these variety of different people that we've had on so far and discipline is a big thing um as we were saying beforehand in the rod sing uh, who who won the the powerlifter who won the gold medal at the um commonwealth games he was mentioning as well like the the discipline for him just takes out all the and this is his words the, the bs um, yeah. do you know what i mean it just, 100% it, it just makes everything so clear he goes i i don't want to think about something that i don't need to think about whether and for him it boiled so, down to even meals because obviously for him like nutrition when he's lifting weights is a, a big thing and just yeah. having the same discipline and just planning out everything so routinely uh just expels all this wasted time where you can actually yeah put that time into something useful yeah no absolutely i 100% agree with that um actually there's one and i think you know what um it's really important gavi to just make sure that you're always learning so mm-hmm. i never think i know it all i think if you always tell yourself that you never know it all like there's always capacity to learn stuff for your own future um but there's i i actually do listen to other people um as well and like their recommendations and i always pick up bits and bobs but i always end up putting my own little mandeep spin on it yeah. <laughs> but 
But there's one method which is really good. It's called the DFT model. Um, and that was by um, Suki Wahiwala. So he, what were his is, so his is the 70, 20, 10. Um, but I, I, I've now started to do that kind of, I've, I, but I realized I was doing a lot of it already, but then now I've started to put numbers next to my tasks. So it right. kind of helps as well, but yeah, definitely look, look that up. They've got some stuff on YouTube as well. Yeah, there's a lot of people at the moment, obviously, um, with, with social media who are coming out with all these different techniques and for, for everything, for productivity, for finances. And, and it is really interesting, obviously. Um, for, for me, just I, I just like reading all the time. So uh, I, I read a lot of books like self-help books and business books. And you get a lot of these little tips from um, that have been used for centuries, but they were just boiled down into one place. It is, yeah. a, it is really, really interesting. Um, so what what was like the first charity that you got in, involved with? Um, so I think the first one that I got involved in was when I was at university and that was St. John's Ambulance. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like, obviously I was always doing like fundraisers and stuff like that when I was younger, but St. John's Ambulance is one that I was, um, that was the first one that I got involved in. I was with them for about eight years um, and, um, you know, became an advanced first aider. Um, but in terms of actually kind of uh, Sikh charities. I think the first one that I ever got involved in was the British Sikh report um, because I always felt it like I, I've kept coming across this report and I felt, you know, it's quite fascinating to see what everyone is actually thinking, what the Sikh community is thinking, where the problems lie, because when you understand where the problems lie, you can then work out solutions of how to rectify them. Um, in terms of, um, but again, you know, that wasn't something I started off or anything that was really there. I kind of just joined um, and um, just started helping them uh, with that. Uh, so in terms of actually setting up own charities, I think that was about two years ago. Yeah, so we we just changed the name today, actually. And um, the new name is Professional Women of Faith. So that was the first organization that I was involved in helping set up mm -hmm. and getting off the ground. Um, and that was really to promote interfaith engagement, interfaith fr friendships and understanding. So even though I was, um, so I was quite involved with, at this point, I was already kind of going very regularly and helping Shepherds Bush Gurdwara as well. Um, and obviously I was part of the British Sikh Report stuff and, you know, there was, there was stuff going on there. Right. And um, so it was, or I already knew that there were, there was, there were these challenges for women um, and there was a need to try and bring women together. And I felt like every time I would go into the interfaith circles, I felt like there was nobody actually that was kind of similar to me. It was like kind of people would go into charities or people would think about faith stuff when they're much, um, um, when they were a lot mature in their life, you know, when they'd kind of done their work and then they started thinking about, oh, you know, let's get involved in a charity. So I felt like it was very different, the challenges that I was facing or, um, the kind of um, not just challenges, but also the experiences I was having and the kind of things I felt like we could have created in interfaith circles was very different. Um, so, yeah, that's where the Professional Women's Interfaith Network came in as part of the WIN network. And then now we've kind of um, set up the uh, Professional Women of Faith um, separately to that. Then what, what, what's your, like your role in that now and what, what is the aims and objectives of that charity? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm the chair um, and, and uh, some of the things that we do is it's really to empower women um, to use their faith as a strength and not see it as a weakness in their success and in their journeys moving forward. Um, so actually this week coming up, um, we've got um, some interviews happening, really excited uh, to have these interviews actually. So one of them is um, with Branjit Kaur, who's a tech expert and um, she's uh, launched her own business, The Seat Coloring Book. And she's an author of like multiple um, children's books. And then on Friday next week, um, we have um, a lady, a lady called Arakia Ismail, and she was the first ever um, a Somalian female to enter politics. Um, and she was also uh, formerly the mayor of Islington. And, um, you know, we're going to be talking about her journey, about going into politics and how she started off with Labour, ended up with Conservatives and what kind of guidance she would give to females that are thinking about going into politics. 
what kind of things that they can do on their like kind of journeys now you know like a lot of people think that um you know if you want to go into politics sort your own kind of like lives out first and and then when you've got nothing to do then go into politics and i think that's the that's where you have all these decisions that are made for people that are like us but we don't have any control over it because we don't have the right representation in in politics mm -hmm. um so i think that's where it kind of we really want to try and encourage more people to get into politics so it's these kind of conversations and dialogues that we're having uh, we're also doing a campaign now where we're doing um it's a it's a like an exhibition uh, campaign on different women who practice their faith so like where they're amradari or where they wear their hijab um and um they are in professions like they're surgeons or they're barristers and things like that and that is something that we want to take all around london and then hope hopefully around the country and then we're open to even taking it out internationally as well that's really cool like that's that's sort of what i hope to achieve in this podcast as well as just highlighting different uh, ethnicities different faiths and how like it it can positive positively impact you uh if you if you everyone's can has a choice in my opinion like the ball it boils down to like either positive or negative how you want to view anything and then move yeah. forward that's how I've seen things for like since I was a kid. It's just like if you want to take the negative, you can dwell on it, or you can take the positives and move forward. And obviously, a lot of the time, people can see uh, see the downsides of of um, being the ethnicity that they are, and maybe not getting the job role or whatever that they want. But yeah. if you take the positives and say, "Look, we come from this background. We're proud, and it's instilled all of these things in us, and it's so so much more powerful." Uh, in, in, in my opinion anyway. Um, but also, Gurveed, I'm just going to touch on something you said, and I think you literally hit the nail on the head there, because often what happens is um, where you, it's your perception and how you deal with things. So like when it came to fostering and we realised there was a need for, um, there, was a, there was a growing need to have more, in, encouraging more Sikhs and South Asians to get into fostering, um, because there were more children going there. I mean, looking at that situation, when you find out something like that, you can either sit there and you can say, right, you know, the Gurdwara should have done this. You know, this person should have done this. Why are all these charities? Why are they not doing this? You can either, and I literally, Gurveer, I can have that discussion 15 times a day, mm -hmm. you know, but what does it achieve? Yeah. But what we did is, and how we turned it around was, we said, okay, there's an issue there. There's nobody doing anything about it. What can we do about it? Who can we bring together to actually um, create, a, uh, a, create a, a kind of a team that can actually go and rectify this issue? So it's always like, however you see it, you, I personally feel you drain more energy talking crap <laughs> basically yeah. about why other people have not done it. And it wastes less energy doing it, actually doing it yourself. And actually finding the right people to do it with you 100 percent. I, I couldn't agree more and let, let's talk about culture fostering because uh if i'm honest before we we obviously set up this podcast i wasn't too aware of this issue um yeah. uh, so do, do you have like statistics or i, I don't know like could you yeah know yeah we've this? we've got it's difficult to get exact like st statistics specifically for Sikhs because mm -hmm. councils don't collect them um, and they never have collected them um, in the past. So actually what we're trying to do is we're actually trying to change the mindsets of um, the councils and, uh, and as well as long uh, uh, alongside parents and potential people to actually get into fostering. So the growing need of fostering basically comes about because um, you have uh, more people that are um, kind of like alcohol drug addicts um, with both sexes. So like when I guess when we kind of came into the UK, you'd often hear about um, the the male um, figure in the family being or the father uh, basically um, being an alcoholic but it was hardly ever the mothers um, but now what you're finding is there's obviously that growth in both parents right um, the other thing you're finding is there's more like people that are dying from cancer and things and then it's a real struggle um, on the parent um, and also you know that there's a lot more kind of divorces and stuff like that happening so obviously what happens is um, when uh, people kind of get divorced they'll be saying the father's not good for the ch uh, for the children the father will be saying the mother's not good for the children and the judge will be saying okay you've told me things you've told me things so uh, actually what I've the conclusion I've come to both of you are not good enough for them they need to go into care 
Right. I think those are things people don't realize. Um, and actually, because of that, there's a lot more children actually going into care. Um, and and the, the struggle is, um, and this is the complete honesty, um, a lot of um, like the Punjabi Asian community feel embarrassed mm -hmm. to be in the care system um, in, in terms of finding a job where you're a carer and you're getting paid to care for someone that is not um, seen as good as a lawyer or a doctor or those kind of things but they don't realize that actually when you do something like that help a child that you know has had a really difficult background help a child that has you know been through loss of a parent you know like what must they be going through they need that time they need that attention and then you know like we kind of started off with trying to just encourage more Sikhs to getting in like more Sikhs to get into uh, fostering and to understand, look, there's a need there. We need to do this. It's save our, let's do it, right? Uh, but then actually we ended up getting connected to um, two girls that are now on our board as well. And they actually went into care themselves. So there were four siblings. They went into care together separately. And the two brothers were split up when their father passed away. And the mum wasn't, um, never had the capacity, like the mental capacity to then look after them. So, you know, it made it really difficult, you know, for these girls like these these children because they got to a point where the dad was from the the father that he was from india he would teach them punjabi he would take them to the gurdwara he would do like all those kind of things and and he's gone and these girls are now gone into a home where you know the person doesn't know how to make roti the person's trying to learn how to make roti um you know so i would definitely say those girls um just seen karen they are the heart of our organization because they've told us stuff that has meant now what we're doing is we're doing like a cooking series so we're working with chef Arbinder, um who is a master chef to actually do videos on what are like easy to cook meals for a Punjabi child kind of thing what are his favorite meals when he was a kid and um, you know we've worked we're working alongside basics of Sikhi to create videos to say what do you do when you go into a Gurdwara so people that are caring for Sikh children they don't feel like they can't go into Gurdwara because they're not welcome or they don't know what to do when they go there. So we've given them as much resources as possible. The idea is we'll give them as much resources as possible to try and make sure that child stays connected. Um, and, you know, the girls, they'll talk about so many different things about like how when growing up, you know, they would be so excited to tie a on their brothers. But when they went into care, that stopped. Yeah. And how do you explain that? you know um so it's like we've now uh, created like a calendarized system so we talk about all the kind of Sikh festivals the Hindu festival all the kind of like main festivals but also some of the cultural ones where the children might want to um you know do those kind of things um so yeah th there's just they're just like some of the parts um and we're also conscious that uh, it's not necessary for you to the only way that you can help is you know, Gurvi, like you're the only way you can help is not because, you know, you actually being a foster parent, there's other ways you can help, you know, you can help, you can potentially be like um, the, uh, a friend where you kind of uh, go to their, pick them up, you get, obviously you have to get all your DBS checks done by the local authority that's looking after those children, um, but you can actually become a volunteer, you can take them to the Gurdwara once a week on the journey oh, well. there and back, you're mm -hmm. talking to them, you can actually have the other family members as well, they're with you, but it's a case of there is still ways that you can still keep that child in Sikhi, even though they're not there, because yeah. that kind of stuff is really, really important. And I think it's um, been useful in that with Castle Fostering, we've had an opportunity to educate um, local authorities about the importance of trying to find children that have the right religious match as well. You yeah. know, because those were things that was never looked at. It was kind of like, OK, if you've got, um, you know, um, a child there you've got a vacancy there this is the child's kind of background these are the other children you've got there okay like this sounds like a good fit you're asian yeah group them together kind yeah. of thing you know but it might not be the right thing for the child and um, these other things are very very crucial um in their upbringing so let's not put them sideline them so we're here to now advocate share those stories of how it actually affected the people that went through that care system and how much they longed for those things 
Yeah, I think you you don't realize the little things, do you? Like it, it's it's something that a lot of people would take for granted because it is part of normal life. But a, a lot of the a lot of the time on these podcasts, I've I've said uh, numerous times is that relatability is is like second to none. Like uh, I had Inder Basi on, who's a professional boxer, and yeah. when other Sikhs want to get into boxing, they'll see a person who is a professional boxer, and it makes it that tiny bit more achievable that that relatability. Um, like even so he he abolished the beard rule in amateur boxing where they had to shave their beard and he was involved in in that process of basically allowing Sikhs to be included because then they don't have to shave their beard anymore and just them little things that allow more inclusive inclusivity make make a massive massive difference and I can only imagine if you're going from a Sikh household to a, a non-Sikh household when you're very proud of where you like your your culture and your background to maybe it not being as as prevalent then you might feel like suppressed which is it's just not good for anybody like we see nowadays obviously mental health's a massive thing and rightfully so and, and obviously that could play a part on them things as well one um channel that I actually uh, seen recently was um I think it's on YouTube and it's literally just called dad how do I and that's like the name of the YouTube channel. And it's yeah. I think it's this guy in America and bless him. He's done like thousands of videos of the most simple, like simplest tasks that, again, as we say, we would take for granted, like the little yeah. intricacies that you just, you, you wouldn't even think of. And it's, uh, I think it was because he didn't have a father who could show him how to do all these things. So then he made a YouTube channel. He's got X amount of videos just telling other kids how to do the smallest of tasks yeah it, it that's is really, really nice. nice that's really nice I think this is what we need like from people mm -hmm. we need people to think about um you know and you know I, I can't we can't even fully blame people for not taking those initiatives up for themselves because it's like maybe they never came across this issue yeah. like maybe it takes for um someone to have gone through this kind of life-changing thing but what's really nice is where people have gone through it themselves and they come back to help other people Mm -hmm. because I think when you've kind of got the privilege and you've never kind of gone through it yeah you might do it but you're like mentally you're not going to relive those moments like when yeah. I talk about it I don't relive any moments and those girls bless them you know when they talk about it and they talk about their stories and it's like every time I'm like I, I really struggle to like listen to their stories because I'm like they're repeating it because they want to get that information out but what must they be going through every single time they repeat that story right mm -hmm. Like, it's not nice, like, to keep on reliving it, but they relive it so another child doesn't have to go through it. So it's something really, like, you know, for someone like that, you know, to create that kind of YouTube channel, to create and, and use what they've gone through positively to make a positive impact on others, I think that's just amazing. 100%. Like, it's like, what well, we've said it a couple of times now, it's like the the negative or positive aspect that you can take and using that positive one but it's also the relatability like where, when them two girls are, are talking about it and if they if they do talk about um talk to sorry other other children who are in in the system then they will have that extra like layer of re relatability and like I yeah. actually know what you're going through yeah. so and and I think when you're especially when you're a kid and you think that oh nobody understands me uh, when you see somebody who can actually talk about the little details that someone who hasn't went through that experience might miss it just makes it a bit more comforting and a bit more like you can open up to that person a bit more yeah which is uh, which is amazing as I say I was completely ignorant to this uh topic before um before today really but it is it's it's, it's an amazing thing I think that's that that is maybe why other people might not have done it so far is because they might just not know about the issue. Yeah. But now there's a lot to learn. There is a lot to pick up. But you know what? I always see it as like blessings because it's all the right people come together to make these kind of things happen. Um, and if you start something with the right mindset that you're doing it to make a change and, you know, like we're really flexible as well in that, you know, there's been stuff that we've learned on our journey. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, we started off doing it you know just thinking we're just going to encourage people to like become foster parents it's not as easy as that you know it's like there's so many other steps behind it there's so many other ways people can help and they can start having a realization of the issue and then but and then you know then we came across like just seeing Kiran and you know the way that they helped but you know I think the other thing is like um it's listening to stories like they've got some like really sad stories where you've got times where you've got they're with 
uh, a family who they've got their own kids and is these guys and they're getting paid for it remember and the girls would come into the car and they would tell their children to put the sweets away oh no and it's like when we talk about these things and they're like five six year olds yeah these five six year olds are very intelligent they're going to remember you yeah. know that lady whose house they went into the first night they went into foster care she was the one that made an effort to try and learn how to make roti for them a 5 and a 6 year old acknowledge that these children remember so even if you do these things do it for the right reason and remember you will have a very real impact on these children you know and to understand the additional responsibility that comes with it not just you know what is on like paper like you know you need to have all these checks done you need to have all this done mm-hmm. but actually the impact that you're going to make on these children that's where we feel like it's so important to share stories and to talk about this kind of stuff so that people can actually realize what the issue is and how we're going to fix it and become better individuals ourselves in the process of doing it you don't realize how strong uh, emotions are like how how easy it like is to recollect i think people recollect uh, emotions way more than like actual memory so when you 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 like hear something or smell something or see something again then obviously your mind goes back to them like them situations and obviously them girls will probably have that um over and over again when when obviously when they were like recalling their memories and and speaking about it even further mm. i'm not really quite sure be- how to transition into into the seat game from this because that is a quite a deep topic yeah and uh, but i guess that is the transition <laughs> um <laughs> uh, we'll just keep it simple <laughs> yeah um yeah so the seat games is something that is going to be coming up uh uh quite shortly you like obviously you've you've done the setting up and um another person that we spoke to was now who's also quite uh involved in it as well um so just talk me through what the seat games is and what what we're looking forward to <laughs> okay so you're looking forward to something really exciting so the seat games um essentially is um a sporting movement to encourage more seat children to get into mainstream sport um but as the key is we are open so there will be elements where there will be within like team sports they will definitely be allowing people from different faiths to also join because we're appreciative of the fact that we're like the first kind of community to set something like this up um so really it's going to be i almost don't want to tell you too much <laughs> <laughs> The suspense um, is killing me. Yeah, the suspense. I know we're just going to dangle the carrot there. So we're encouraging more people to get into mainstream sport. Um we've got, you know, amazing ambassadors who are going to be there to share their journeys. Um we're creating a lot more on equality with regards to disability. Again, that's a discussion, the only discussion I ever had um really within our communities about disability was whether or not a wheelchair is going to be allowed in a group car or not. it was never what do we do for the person inside that wheelchair like how do we make them feel a part of us mm-hmm. um so you know there's loads of things we're targeting here we're also trying to do something where we're creating like a regional model so we're trying to make different we're trying to abolish this whole like car system thing that we've got going on we want to try and get people to actually work together come together for the benefit of our next generations and future generations i i really look forward to it as 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 i said beforehand like a lot of the guests that i've had on so far have been fitness related i've had obviously as i said mentioned already in the bossy who's professional boxer i've had manmeet jagpal who's in the england team for futsal uh we've had indraj who's a powerlifter in all these different sports and i like speaking to people who are involved in sports not only because of the representation uh and it makes it more achievable because of the relatability that we've mentioned but also yeah. because it's it's one of them things where it is it's it's a sport in general anything is more like a thing where a kid can just sort of none of the like caste or ethnic minority none of that even matters it's like everybody's there doing something they all appreciate that they're doing the same thing you get to socialize with other people and a lot of the things that i think kids are now were missing out on sports is basically really really key for do you mean you get to talk yeah. to your friends you get a be you get to develop communication skills you get to get to develop leadership skills if it's team sports and uh, again when when you speak into so many people from different backgrounds which sports includes everybody then yeah. these preconceived notions of maybe different uh, ethnic backgrounds just get abolished when you have a positive yeah. experience with somebody who doesn't look like you then your preconceived notion of other people who don't look like, like you will start to become positive and not negative 
Absolutely, absolutely. You know what? It's all about representation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like in all the kind of places that we go in, like you know, we want to. Um, we're really trying to like one of the focus, and so everywhere you go, you have success. So you have success in politics, you have success in industry, you have success on the playing field as well. You know, but it's to have that kind of thing. But it's like you've got a lot of people that. Um, the more people that go into these spaces, like for example, like Jagmeet Singh, when he goes into uh, politics and he stands for an election every single Sikh around the world is winning, every single ethnic minority around the world is winning that day, you know, and you've got people like Karen Jett Baines, you know, she's doing it, that's not, she's not doing it for herself, she's doing it for every other core around the world that day, you know, and like, we're all looking at her, and we're all thinking, that's like, you know, one of us, like, we could be it, what's that show, what that shows is, like, you know, with the younger kids, that's showing them the world is their oyster, they're unstoppable, they put their mind to something they can achieve anything so that's the kind of that's like again another element you know we've got Karen Jett involved as well with the seat game so it's like we've got the kind of ambassador focus as well to make sure that we're highlighting and creating a platform to highlight the stories of those that have done really well to encourage the next generation to um encourage the parents <laughs> as well yeah. you know you say like you know like people can do other stuff like people don't only have to you know like Karen she's an amazing example she's um you know she's a chartered accountant for uh, KPMG yeah. and she's a powerlifter you know she's doing those <laughs> you can do them together actually how's one helped you with the other and vice versa you know so it's really to try and create that kind of mindset that you know this sport is not only good for you physically but also um it will help you in so many skills like you just mentioned you know like team building and you know I was very much into sport I went to a sports college I was doing literally there was five days of the week but I was doing six sports because on one of the days we had um uh we had badminton and trampolining in the same hall so I do both I would jump and then yeah. when it was time to learn a new skill I would go literally there and I would jump. say yeah I, I literally was just like hopping through both because it was in the same hall I could do it but mm-hmm. here's the thing right like when I and I was also like the captain of the basketball team but what did that teach me that taught me where do you put different people mm-hmm. it's not where do I want to go where do you know we want to win we're going in this together how do we all win how do is how do we capitalize on our skill set you know how do we make because it's in our interest to make sure everyone's confident it's in our interest to make sure everyone's achieving that's the beauty of sport like you don't see that in industry you don't see that in other things but when you have someone that's in sport they're always going to be like especially where they're playing team sports they're always going to be the kind of people that are good at building everyone around them because they understand we're all going for the common goal and when you know that that applies to sport you'll apply it to other things you'll apply it to your place to work you'll apply it to your charities you'll apply it to your organizations it's not we're not on this journey on our own we're only here and we always do better you know uh, we we do as well as our as the team does right yeah so that's-, that's it I think you, you hit the nail on the head before when you gave Jigmeet as the example is that everybody gets behind like when you see Karanjeet in the in the papers uh, or in, in, in any article you, you're happy it's the thing we, we were saying before is when you see somebody who makes the effort to go out of their way and sort of mention your ethnic background but when you see somebody of your own ethnic background on the TV as I mentioned before like from Newcastle there's not many there's not many Sikhs up here so when I was going down south and I would see other people I'm, I was still in the in the uh sort of mindset of like pointing to like my parents and be like oh look there's a person with a tape in there or when it's on <laughs> yeah. you know I mean? or like when it's on yeah. tv I'd be like oh look there's a sing in the back yeah the yeah, token ex- Sikh that goes in the background <laughs> exactly exactly uh, the Man United matches as well yeah yeah the, the things that were behind uh yeah. so Alex Ferguson there and you you would um you get that sort of buzz and obviously when when you're a kid that seeing them things like makes you open up like your possibilities and I think uh, honestly it is really really good and that's what like I, I'm trying to highlight on this not just obviously Sikhs but obviously every like sort of ethnic background because I feel like a lot of the ethnic backgrounds are the same if you're like from uh, descendants of immigrants but it's yeah. it is like that if you see somebody doing something that looks like you from the same background as you it just becomes so much more achievable yeah Um, and we've got to support them right because if we support them they do well that person could be a direct inspiration for my future children yeah like this is the thing like we need to start changing and shifting our mindsets we need to realize that when one wins we all win 
you know? 100%. I think that even more on that is that everybody likes to support the people who are achieving it, but nobody like wants that for their own kids at the moment. And that is that mind shift that we need to switch. Like, I think when I, especially yeah. like, I get so proud of seeing somebody yeah. on the TV and, and uh, like giving them adulation, but then would, would like my parents want me to do the exact same thing as an example. Um, yeah. and, and I think it is like, hopefully it it's all, yeah it's all about education though right it's like yeah. if you look at what happens in the syllabus in a private school or grammar schools there is so much push on sports because they understand the benefits of that because they're not just creating someone that is gonna just go and work in a job and that's gonna be it that person needs to be able to do well in that job that person need, be, needs to have team building skills in that you know and actually you know like um I think I was quite lucky in that um, when I was younger, my parents um, in their business, when they were kind of be sat there, people would come with, when they had older children and they would come and say to my dad, oh, you know, make sure you get your children to do this. Make sure you get your children to do this. So he was always like, yes, let's go to your cycling competition. Let's do this. Let's do this. But, you know, I think also because we like everyone was very athletic, you know, he used to do like a thousand press ups every single day and I used to just sit there and count like that's how I learned how to count I used to just watch him do a thousand press-ups in one go you know and he still does like hundreds on hundreds like now but it's like they is understanding and it's about educating the parents as well and the children um to say like you know because it's just they feel like the only way you're going to achieve success is if you are all you're doing is studying and all you're doing is getting good grades but sometimes and I've seen it because I used to train like the cadets when it was when I was at St John's Ambulance all these children they wanted to go into medicine right. and they would get rejected and they would then start joining St John's Ambulance because they needed to do extra stuff because grades are not enough yeah you know you need to have you need to have this variety of stuff you need to have a variety of experiences and people are trying to block their children from going into the variety of experiences because they feel like it's going to take away from them actually studying. But actually, like myself firsthand, I know sport helped me because I knew I wanted to do the sport. And I knew after school, I did it like literally every single day when I was at high school. Um, and I would go home and I would have such a short window in which to do my work in that I wasn't procrastinating. I was just like, OK, I wanted to do that, got to do that now i've got this much time i've got an hour slot i need to get my work done let's get it done and if i wasn't doing the sport and like there are times like on the weekends and stuff you're not doing stuff that same piece of work is going to take you two or three hours because you're like looking out the window yeah. and you just see like anything that needs seeing you're just seeing and you know why is there dust underneath this dining table what is going on there <laughs> let me speculate on this you know like we've all been there right but yeah it teaches you time management it it makes you better you know and makes you value your time more yeah exactly and and discipline alongside it is hand in hand and that competitive nature that it in, instills as well allows you to thrive in environments like you were mentioning before uh, and get further perhaps because now you you want to win you've been taught from a young age like if you if you're going to do something you want to win at it um and another another sort of topic i want to weirdly transition to because i'm not very good at segues is uh, <laughs> is um change your, the topic. <laughs> uh, change the topic there we go as simple as is your role as a cultural advisor to the mayor of london as well so um how did that come about and what does what does that actually entail as well um so that is kind of uh, very much in terms of so i'm a, i i'm part of the steering committee to the to the gla and advise the gla which is the mayor of london's office so right. it's the Greater London Authority that I actually advise. And um, so I advise them on kind of um, like all the um, seek things that are kind of happening, seek events that are happening, you know, like I'll be involved with, um, you know, any, the, any of the seek events that take place at City Hall or like Trafalgar Square, for example. So that's where I'm kind of like generally quite involved in. I'd like, um, I've helped organize like visits to like Gurdwaras for him um, and, you know, got him to make some rotina but also <laughs> explaining what it is and why it is important to make sure that that diversity is understood in the capital city um you know and it, you have to keep on you you have to keep on like you know educating and talking about it because there are they are our issues if we don't talk about them and you know we don't do the right thing um and use that space 
correctly, we're not doing justice to mm -hmm. you know our own kind of faith group either. Yeah, I think well, it's been the reoccurring theme throughout this conversation. It's just that understanding other people. Do you know what I mean like if if you understand other people, you can accommodate their needs a lot a lot better. And I think that's something that um, the census is is trying to do. I know obviously by the time this podcast comes out, I think the census will have uh, sort of been done. But um, as I seen recently, like obviously, isn't the whole purpose of the census is to understand how many people are from different backgrounds so they can yeah. accommodate their needs. And uh, it is very important because I feel like. Up and especially sort of don't really get involved in them sort of things. They probably get a itchy teeth through the door and, and they'll just probably look at it and put it in the bin or something. But yeah. it's important that you you, you sort so of make important. your make your representation. It's, yeah. I mean the seat games is really looking for the census and what the census data is saying. Yeah. We're like literally waiting for the results now. Um when once everyone's obviously sent their replies in. Uh, but yeah, very much like, you know, when we look at kind of how we were going to shape the regional model, mm -hmm. we looked at the last census, very, very much out of date. I'm sure, many things have changed, mm -hmm. but it's really, really important to make sure you're very accurate about these things. Because, you know, with the Sikh Games, we're looking, we're looking at regional data um, to see, like, where are the Sikhs? How many Sikhs are in there in each place? Like, how do we make this fair for everyone? Um, so actually, I think data, not just for that, that's not something as serious, but for other things like, for example, you've got with the NHS, like within this ethnicity, we've got a certain lifestyle, we eat certain types of foods, you know, mm -hmm. what are our health conditions, what is the impact, what is it because of, you know, like, it's so important to have this accuracy, because if you just put us all under the same kind of bracket to say we're like, you know, we're just we're just Indian, yeah. you know, but we're like, our lifestyle might be so different to the life, lifestyle of someone in Gujarat, you know? That's why it's important to have a greater understanding about people and break it down more so. And I don't say this just for Sikhs, I think for everybody, for everybody's benefit, it needs to be a lot more accurate and people need to engage with the census, um, you know? The example that you use with the NHS is the one that actually sort of piqued my attention in it a bit more because it is like if you have like an elder in your family who doesn't speak the language, then um, it is one of them things where like they might go to the hospital and they might not be, they might speak broken English and they need someone to speak Punjabi. But if that representation is not there, then it isn't, isn't um, as attainable for them. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um. Am I allowed to go on a little bit of a tangent here? It'll only take one minute. <laughs> All right, go on. One more minute. <laughs> uh, BAME, the, the, the like term BAME. When we're speaking about like obviously the census and how specific you should be because you need to find out which ethnicity groups, which religion groups, which languages are spoken. But then in the media and the government always use this term BAME. That sort of irks me because it sounds like it's just like anything that is a shade of darker than beige it's just all in this one category yeah. um i don't know if like you agree or disagree and if if there is any benefits to that term because i really dislike the term that's a different spin on it i've never thought about it like in the sense that i didn't feel of it as a demeaning term but i know that people and organizations um they want to have bame representation like it's very much like a tick box exercise i feel like mm there needs to be more work done. Like, I feel like a lot of stuff is just justified um, or just kind of done in a way. So you have like your token BAME representative in each organization. Like, I think those kind of things need to change. I think more um, education definitely needs to be there around that. But I, I do feel like it, look, it definitely needs to be broken down because just BAME as a whole does not mean you've got South Asians, right? Like, where's your focus on South Asians? Because, mm -hmm. like, if you look at the music industry, you've got a lot of BAME representation in mainstream music, but where are all the South Asians? Yeah. You know, when are they ever getting looked at kind of thing? So it's like, it is a very, very wide term. I don't think, I think it just kind of is a, I don't think it, it fixes the issues it's meant to fix. It's not built for purpose, that word. Mm -hmm. um i feel like it's just yeah i don't i don't think it's helpful um as such in terms of actually making sure you have adequate representation from all all types of you know the people that are make up this um diverse uh, world that we live in 
Well, yeah, exactly. So, like, the reason I ask is very recently, I think a couple of days ago, um, Hardeet Hardeet Singh Malik, I think was his name, was the first Indian pilot uh, in in the RAF, and he was in the World War, and they're creating a statue in his honor, but they're doing it as a uh, a representation to BAME communities. Uh, involvement in the world war so obviously as a, as a Sikh I'm, I'm like I'm very proud that we uh, a Singh is getting a statue yeah. however it's not just us that have and been involved in that world war do you mean there the are well as BAME suggests black Asian and minority ethnics is a whole host so it's like yeah. this is the one time that we are actually seeing like the the quote-unquote benefit from it but there are other times yeah. that um, we don't, and another BAME uh, ethnic minority group will will see the benefit, and it's just like, it just doesn't sit right with me because it is just like that whole. It doesn't really represent. When you try to cover too many angles, you end up covering none. Is how I see it, if if that makes sense. But that's again, very true. Uh, that's very true. And could we, you know, what I'm gonna say, I really like and and appreciate your kind of mindset and mentality around this. That it's not just, even if it does work in a Sikh's favor to have a Sikh statue because it's not fair on others it's still not right it doesn't make it right Mm -hmm. and that's the thing right we've it's it's understanding that it has to be the right thing for everybody not just right for ourselves um and and again you know when it comes to like the farmers protest and things like that you know you've got like um 1.366 billion people living in Punjab if you say 70 percent of them that's over 900 million people that yeah. are affected by agriculture that are, ne- are meant to be neg- negatively affected and you've got 20.8 million Sikhs there of that 936 or whatever it is you've only got 20 you know why is it that all those people are making that noise because we will always stand up against political um you know um pol- political oppression and tyranny you know so i think it's really important to kind of understand and gauge that that to please a Sikh you can't just put a statue up yeah. Like you need to be fair for everybody. You need to create a situation where you're not just telling us we're great. You need to actually do great for everyone and you need to acknowledge everyone. So I think it's very beautiful that you touched on that and that it still affects you. So well done. Yeah, no, 100%. And with the farmers protest issue, it's like that that number is ridiculous. We, I did a podcast like breaking it down with, uh, again, with Indra Basi and um, uh, Dr. Sharandeep Singh, who's from Sikh Cent from Scotland um because uh, he was on the bbc and he got like attacked for uh, on that and I, I didn't think that was right so i reached out he we, responded we had... very well though he yeah. responded Im- immaculately i i i uh, really gave him credit even in the podcast i said like to keep you calm it's it's a good representation for what we stand for not to like get hot-headed and, and lose your rag but the statistics that we like we talked about in that podcast is is mind-boggling you mentioned it there like over 800 900 million people are affected and that's the more than the entire population of europe and it's it's crazy crazy numbers what's happening but um, yeah, I tried to break that down all in English and very statistic based so everybody can understand it and just sort of look at it um, uh, like for what it is without any sort of distractions of religion or anything. It's purely down to farmers versus government. Um, I've really enjoyed this conversation. We've t- touched on so many uh, different topics and, and I've educated myself in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, but what I like to do at the end of each podcast with every guest is ask them the same five questions in sort of like a quick fire fashion if that's okay with yourself okay, okay. rapid fire round yeah <laughs> <laughs> um they are a bit deep yeah so th- we'll, we'll try to be as quick as possible but they're right. a bit deep so number one is what are you most proud of that's really hard <laughs> <laughs> this they is gonna be not rapid this is not gonna be a rapid response okay um i I can't say that I am because I don't think anything that I do is perfect at the moment. I can't say there's something that I'm like really proud of um, because everything feels like work in progress. Um, proud of, I don't know, being seek. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know if I can be proud of that. I shouldn't be proud of that. But yeah, I just, you know what? I feel like, yeah, I, I can't say I'm kind of, nothing is perfect at the moment where I can say I'm proud of that. Maybe time I'll progress. come back and say that went really well. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Uh, number two is what are you most looking forward to? I am really, really excited um, for launching a seat games. Number three is what is your biggest motivation? 
biggest motivation is seeing the hope in young people's eyes and the legacy and the world that we can create for them. Number four is what is your definition of success? Success where you have not only done something in your term of being, but you created a legacy for the generations to come. And because it's the Culture Cast podcast, how has your culture affected you this far? My culture has, um, I would say my culture has made me a lot happier <laughs> as a person. Um, I think it's gave me understanding um, about people, other people around the world. I think it's taught me compassion. Uh, it's, it's, it's good. It's been colourful. And Perfect. tasty as well. I <laughs> <laughs> Very tasty. Uh, I'll agree with that one. I've really enjoyed this. Uh, I really, really enjoyed this. Um, all of uh, Mandeep's links will be in the description uh, and all the charities and all the information will be down and below, whether you listen to Spotify, Apple Music or watching on YouTube, all the links will be there. Um, so go support, go find out more because we've only touched the surface on a lot of things here. So um, you can find out a lot more information um, through them links in the description. Um, is there anything that you want to say as a like last sort of remark? No, Gavi, thank you. I'm really like, I feel like I want to say like, I'm really proud of you. You know, like it's been really nice doing this. Um, it's very different to the kind of like usual kind of podcasts that I do because um, they're kind of more like topical legal stuff. So this has been nice. It's been really fun. And thank you for giving me an opportunity to share about all these initiatives and things that I'm a part of and share them with the world. No, no, thank you. Honestly, thank you. Not only for your time today, but also all of the things that you're, you're doing. Like, um, it's just honestly, it's amazing. And and I think you'll be an inspiration to a lot of a lot of people. Um, they'll, they'll definitely be looking up to what you're doing and, and what you're implementing. And it's 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 a really good, like really good things. <laughs> I can't say I can't even express how, how much goodness. They're good. Is. They're really good. <laughs> no, exactly. <Thank> you. <laughs> I'm running out of adjectives. <laughs>